I'm Jim from Geeks on Tour. Welcome to the first of what we hope will be an irregular interview feature on the channel. Have you heard of This Is True by Randy Casingham? This Is True is the oldest entertainment newsletter on the internet. It started in 1994, and I've been a subscriber since about 2008. Every week I enjoy Randy's offbeat news items. They make me think and often make me laugh. Sometime last year, he started a new site called ResidentialCruising.com. I learned how he had purchased a cabin on the Villa V Odyssey cruise ship and is now living and working on board. I knew Chris would be interested, so I sent her the link. Oh yeah, she liked it so much that she contacted the company and arranged for a week aboard to check it out. We met Randy and Kit Casingham soon after we arrived on board the Odyssey. Chris learned more about Randy's background, entrepreneurial spirit, adventurous lifestyle, and ability to reinvent himself, and was so intrigued she wanted to interview him. He said sure. We met up with him in person on his onboard office and chatted a bit. You'll even get a glimpse of Randy's wife, Kit, who will be a guest on a future interview. Meet Randy Casingham. So we are here with Randy Casingham of thisistrue.com <laughs> and many of our followers already know him because they follow him, but just in case you don't, thisistrue.com has the title, Making Fun of Bad Decisions Weekly Since 1994. Tell us, how did that come about? How, what made you start that? It all started on the bulletin board, and I mean a cork bulletin board, at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. I would literally cut little stories out of the newspaper, fillers they called them back in the day, and I would highlight certain parts of them just to tell the story very briefly, and I couldn't help but to also write little comments on them. I had a good buddy that worked for NASA that moved to Washington, D.C., and so I would make copies of all those and send them to him by paper mail, and I finally realized, you know, that I had people at JPL that would say, you've got to write a column, you've got to write a column, and that fit right in because I went to journalism school because I wanted to be a columnist, and I kind of went, oh, I don't oh. need to get a newspaper, I can use the internet, oh. Oh, and that's how it started way back in 1994. How did you go from journalism to NASA Jet Propulsion Lab? I was hired as a technical publisher to, to uh, work on the space station project long before it launched. It didn't even launch until several years after I left, after 10 years. But um, I just have a knack for doing a lot of generalist things and uh, I ended up being a uh, software engineer for them and mainly my job was to break the software so they would give me release candidates and I'd spend you know 10-15 minutes on it and I'd say here if you do this and this and this it breaks it, it, you know crashes and they'd go how in the world did you find that I just had a knack <laughs> a knack for breaking things yeah huh? a knack for acting like normal people Pro programmers don't really think about what people do when confronted with something complex. So they want to try something simple. They want to see if they can get around the procedures. And if you do that, it breaks. I get that. I get that. The acting, a knack for acting like normal people. You've also spent a lot of time as an EMT, emergency medical technician. How Medic did, for generic. Medic, yeah. So which came first, EMT or journalism, and how do they relate? Um, I started as a police cadet in Menlo Park, California, which everybody knows because that's the home of Facebook now. And um, I decided, no, police work isn't quite what I want to do, but, you know, the, the sirens get into your blood. And, um, and I was in a crash when I was in high school and got rescued by a, an ambulance and it was like this is interesting so I uh, followed 
the buddy that I got in the crash with. <laughs> And uh, we, we both went into it, and he went on to police work, and I went on to say, you know, this isn't going to pay the bills, so I went back to school and went to journalism school. You know, one of the things that, and how does medic tie into what I do now, um, I found that I got to, to be with people on their worst day, and it didn't really matter whether they were in what we'd call the slums or we'd call, you know, just the most beautiful houses. I was in a house on the San Francisco Bay where the water was literally lapping up underneath the deck. And that's a pretty luxurious home. You know, you can see out across the bay to San Francisco and, um, you know, people are pretty much the same. And it's kind of how do they deal with what's going on in their lives right now and, and how they are with me trying to help them and uh, I've, it, it really tells you a lot about people that to deal with them in that kind of stripped down situation. I have no <laughs> clue how to help somebody who has been in a major traumatic accident in their life. Well that's what training is for for one thing but um, you know it, it's just the ability to have a little bit of empathy and um, and explain to them how you're trying to help them and and really they're they don't generally call for help unless they know they need it and uh, they're they're pretty well open to it but yeah if, if it's you know a really critical situation it you fall back on training you were living in Colorado and you were what in in charge of the EMTs there or something? Um, I was a field supervisor um, for so I, I lived in a county in western Colorado that was 550 square miles and 4,500 people so pretty rural and um, they hired a new um, chief of the EMS shortly after I moved there, and he was from San Francisco. And it turns out we didn't know each other in San Francisco, but um, we knew a lot of people in common, and he knew I had experience, and he asked me to, to come on board and start a first responder corps up in, up in my Mesa, because the Mesa on, on which I lived uh, had about half the population of the county, but it was out of town, and it took a minimum of 20 minutes for an ambulance to get up there. So. You pretty much needed somebody to help keep people going until the ambulance would get there. Mm. And that was my job. So uh, they made me captain of the squad. And so I, because I had experience, uh, I was expected to roll in every call, even if somebody else was closer, so that they knew that there was somebody coming to help them because they were very nervous because they were pretty green and I had experience. So it's like, okay, you keep them going until I get there and I'll help them get it, keep them going until the ambulance gets there. <laughs> But all this time, you were still doing This Is True every week, yes? Right. So by that time, I was full-time. I, I started uh, This Is True when I was uh, at JPL. I took the bulletin board publication and turned it into a more formal publication online, which was the first time anybody had really done something like that. And um, so I, I quit JPL to do it full-time. But you know, when I'm working in a rural environment and working out of my house, if the pager goes off pretty much 24 seven, I could take it an hour off to, to do whatever needs to be done because I didn't actually do the transport. I would just hand them off to the ambulance crew when they got there and keep them stable, start an IV if I needed to, whatever. And then um, the ambulance crew would get there and tell them what was going on and they would take it off for the hospital and. They'll be gone for an hour, but I get to go home. So I didn't have to do the paperwork, which is the best <laughs> part. <laughs> so fast forward to now, you are no longer living in Colorado. That's true. This Where does are not you look like Colorado when you peek out the window. Um, <laughs> take a look around. Yeah, it's a, you can. You can <laughs> this is my office view. Um, you can sort of see that there's a, a ship right next to us. That's a fueling ship, and they're uh, dumping uh, diesel into our tanks so we can keep going. And um, there's a bunch of ships out there you may have seen. 
they're waiting to get into the Panama Canal, which we came through uh, yesterday and finished uh, coming through there. So uh, very interesting. New and you're life. not on vacation. No, this is my office on the ship. I live here, not in the office, but I live on the ship. And, oh, you do uh, live here. <laughs> yeah, most of my waking hours are within this, you know, six, you know, what's, what's eight times, 64 square feet is, is the max I've got here. But, um, you know, I, I still take time off in the middle of the day, just, you know, go out and have dinner or, you know, we're in an interesting port. You know, I'll go out for a couple hours and, and see the world. But you don't always, right? Just just because you're on a cruise ship and it's in Puerto Vallarta doesn't mean that you have to get off and see no, Puerto Vallarta. No, you don't have to do anything. So I just really enjoy it. It's kind of like my life in Colorado where I work every day and I play every day. So how does living on a cruise ship affect your work? Does, it, does the fact that you're living on a cruise ship help or hinder your computer work? Um, neither. It's just my environment. Um, when we lived in the U.S., I would, uh, my wife and I would put on conferences, two conferences a year for a for an entrepreneurs group, and so we would, uh, you know, go wherever in the U.S. to put that on because we moved it around the, the entire U.S. And I would sit in the hospitality suite, and I would have my laptop with me, and I would just be writing and also talking at the same time with other attendees and you know listening into conversations while I was writing so I really developed the habit of being able to work in kind of any environment so this well, is I wonder, it's the, not a bizarre environment for me so. the fact that you don't have to cook clean plan travels kind of frees you it to does. do your work more doesn't it it, it does and and uh, I was the usual cook at home so not having to go to the store and buy groceries and you know I don't even have a car anymore <laughs> so um, I did retire from the EMS stuff but um, but yeah I have more time now do you get any inspiration for your this is true stories from on board or is that kind of off limits I, well this is true uses real news stories from from real news publications from around the world and I what I do is I summarize the story very briefly in order to lead to a point and the tagline at the end is either a wry observation or uh, a pissed off observation <laughs> or whatever uh, think about this observation and it doesn't th things on the ship don't really come up in the news although this ship was in the news when we were delayed for a long time I didn't write about it so much and this is true, but I have another site called residentialcruising.com where I write about this lifestyle. And, um, you know, occasionally I would find, for instance, a newspaper article about our delay in Belfast. And they would just lie and lie and lie about what it was like. So I would tear the story apart and say, no, this is what it's really like. And that was a lot of fun. I, I have fun doing that. We've talked about that. Yeah. That's what it's all about, right? Is yeah. is having fun. Yes, and all of your posts both make you think and give you a laugh. Yeah. That's so wonderful. It's it's all about making you think but having fun doing it. So you know, the stories are are generally humorous, which makes them fun to read, even if I am trying to make a serious point with it. What I appreciate the most about you is that you're an early adopter. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got onto the internet 1994. The World Wide Web, anyway, was absolutely brand new. Right. I, and, I, I remember Net, uh, Netscape Navigator coming out and then trying to figure out how to code web pages. Yeah, so I, early adopter is and, definitely what I and do. And now with the life on a cruise ship, Very new. I mean, a residential life on a cruise ship, you jumped right on at the first... I wanted to be on the first ship when they first sailed. And here we are. So do you not feel the fear that most of us feel about doing something that's <laughs> brand new and nobody knows anything about? Sure, I feel the fear. Um, but it's 
it's manageable and you manage the risk and you open yourself up to the possibility yeah it's brand new it's a brand new business it's a brand new travel sector it nobody's done this before can it fail hell yeah um, but you set yourself up so that if it fails you don't end up on the street starving but travel was not a big part of your life was it or is there something I've missed? Yeah, it's, it's always been an aspect and my okay. wife um, was from the travel industry the hospitality industry and she, she snuck in here while we were oh talk, talking. hey kids hey <laughs> and, uh, yeah we'll, we'll get you sometime no <laughs> so we uh, we definitely have had that kind of a spirit both with the uh, conferences we put on but we also you know pretty early on in our relationship we went to um, Eastern Europe and went behind the Iron Curtain of course that was you st did. still there and <laughs> I kept This Is True going by just using the technology to set up issues in advance. And when it was time for an issue to come out, they just came out. So, yeah, it's using the technology appropriately and, and having fun with it. Well, last we, Jim and I, Geeks On Tour, are considering buying a cabin and joining you in this lifestyle. And be on tour permanently. Mm. Exactly. Uh, be on, that will on tour again any advice but we're, we're we are feeling a little bit of the fear you you've probably already done what i would advise and that is to to read every page of the residential cruising site because it'll probably bring up some questions you haven't thought of yet um and to reach out to people who are here which is what you've been doing this last week while you've been on board Coming on board for a week, you know, try before you buy is certainly a, a great idea. And look what you did. You're trying before you're buying. Um, so that'll help answer questions and, and help you deal with the uncertainties. Just one last point. I don't know if you saw our show on Sunday, but we did a Notebook LM. Have you? Notebook LM is an AI tool by Google, and I fed it your Wikipedia page. <laughs> I fed it the This Is True website and the Residential Cruise site, and there's a little button that you can click that will make what sounds like a podcast with a, a yes, woman and a man, yes. and it talks all about you, and I'm going to send you the links, and I'm really curious what you think. I thought it was amazing. If we join this this cruise ship, I think one of our you know, favorite parts will be getting to spend time with you and Kit. This is a, a wonderful thing. Thank you for spending time with us. Well, thanks for swinging by the office. It's always <laughs> fun to talk to you guys.